What's up, y'all? Welcome to another Primary Source walkthrough video. I'm Dr. Hevert, and we're going to be walking through a really interesting primary source for American history in this walkthrough. What are we doing today? Well, you probably already know by the title, but just in case that you don't, we're going to be talking about Ida B. Wells' Lynch Law in America. Like most of the primary sources on this channel, this comes from the American Yop textbook produced by Stanford University Press. It's an open educational resources textbook that you should have a look at. Uh, it's free to look at at theamericanyop.com. Um, it's really helpful. I use it in my classes. Uh, and it's, you know, even if you already have a textbook uh, that your professor, uh, other than myself, uh, has assigned, uh, it's, it's a good other uh, secondary source to, to look through uh, while you're learning American history. This comes from Chapter 18 of the American Yop, and Chapter 18 uh, mostly deals with industrialization and urbanization, but one of the other things that it talks about, Chapter 18 does, is the quote-unquote New South. And one of the questions it asks is, was the New South actually all that new? And what we're going to find out through this primary source is that that isn't really the case that the new south is all that new there's a lot of the old south in the quote unquote new south it's just done differently so the first thing that we need to do is we need to understand what lynching is and there's a really good description of it in the American Yacht textbook. But if you haven't had a chance to read that yet, or you haven't gone over it in your class yet, lynching is the extrajudicial killing by a mob of a person. Okay. The extrajudicial killing of a person by a mob. More often than not, in the 19th century uh, and early 20th century United States, lynching was done to black people. Lots of black men. Now, that's not to say that it didn't happen to people of other eth ethnicities. It happened to Italian Americans, for example. But by and large, we are talking about the extrajudicial killing of black men for a perceived crime. And that perceived crime usually has to do with the, again, perceived violation of a white woman. Usually it's a sexual crime uh, in nature. At least that's the, the accusation leveled. Um, other times it's uh, harm done uh, to a white person. Sometimes it's even just simple disrespect at least perceived disrespect. So when we get to the 1950s and we talk about a young man named Emmett Till, he was lynched because he looked at a white woman and said, bye baby. That's what he was killed for. And in many of these situations, in many of these lynching situations, these crimes, that's all it took. Because there was a need among white people, particularly in the southern United States, to reinforce a strict separation between black men and women and white men and women. This was just another way to enforce that radical Jim Crow segregation. They had already done it in the law. They've done it in the Supreme Court. They've done it uh, in election laws. But here is the threat of violence. If you cross into our realm, the lynch mob says, then you will suffer the consequences. 
and that will mean losing your life in one of the most violent ways imaginable. So, what Ida B. Wells is talking about here is she is getting at the idea of there's this de facto acceptance of lynching. Let's be very, very clear. When I say extrajudicial, that means it is outside the law. It is illegal to lynch somebody. It's murder. That is what it is. However, especially in the late 1890s and early 1900s, where we see over 5,000 black men and women killed by mobs, people look the other way. The law looks the other way. And in fact, sometimes the law facilitates these murders. And by that, I don't mean that the law brings these people to court, puts them on trial or something like that. What I mean is these are law enforcement officials who open the door to the prison cell for the mob to let them get a hold of the black person in that cell so that they can be murdered without a trial, without anything like that. So Ida B. Wells starts off and she says, our national crime is, is lynching. It's this, this is what we do. And what I appreciate so much that she points out, she's going to lay it on the line for us, is she says, look, it's not the violence that's the real horrid crime. That's bad enough. But she says it represents the cool, calculating deliberation of intelligent people who openly avow that there is an unwritten law that justifies them putting human beings to death without complaint under oath, without trial by jury, without opportunity to make defense, and without right of appeal. She's saying the real evil, the most insidious evil, I should say, is not the violence itself. It's that we approve of it. That we, that there are these people, this calculating deliberation of intelligent people who are saying, yeah, this is perfectly acceptable. That this is what we are going to do as a society. In order to police the strict separation between white and black, we are going to violently murder black men. That is terrifying. And if you look at some of the lynching photography in the American Yop, or if you look at any of the other lynching photography, and there's a lot of it, you can see in almost every single instance that the mob are well-dressed white people who look like they've come out for a party. Because in many ways they have. Let's scroll down here. She talks a little bit about this unwritten law. And she says, look, if a white woman accuses a black man of an assault or an insult or anything like that, he's dead. It's just a matter of time before the mob gets him. There's no statute, there's no law that enforces this, but it's just, again, it's this unwritten rule. That if a black man does anything to or with a white woman, his life is forfeit. And the justification that is given is that by perpetrating this violence, by committing the violence against the black body, we are protecting white women. It's supposed to be a deterrent. You know, we're going to leave that black man who said something awful to a white woman up in the tree for a couple days, and we're going to take pictures, and we're going to send those pictures to all of our family, and the whole town is going to see all of this. This is to protect white women so that other black men don't get any ideas. I 
If you're disgusted by this, I completely understand, because I am too. There is no presumption of innocence. There is no due process, no nothing. It's just white people versus black people, and the black people are always going to lose. Now, she continues. And she says that this is worse than any of the brutality of the Middle Ages. And um, as a medievalist myself, uh, I would quibble with that just a little bit. But this isn't the time or the place. I, she's making a point. like Whether or not that is an accurate assessment of the Middle Ages as a whole, which, mm, whatever. I mean, it, the Middle Ages aren't a great place to live. But she's using this imagery to let people know that lynching is a barbaric practice that harkens back to civilization. Here's white men, especially at the time. This is in 1900. Here's white men who are going around the world talking about how great white civilization is and rescuing black and brown people from their savagery because they're somehow pre-modern. And here they are doing this. Lynching people. It's a, one of many of the imperialist hypocrisies. She continues. And Wells lets us know how public these killings are. And she says, look, it's done by leading citizens. Hey, they aid this. Even if they don't participate, they help they allow it to happen. It's published in the media. It's a special event. Okay? It's advertised. The railroads bring people in. People take pictures. They make postcards out of them. They write their families about this. This is a this is I mean it, it's a carnival of a, of an execution. It's a literal carnival of violence. And now even here in the 19th century, in the 1890s, at the turn of the 20th century, it's not just about the hanging. It's about mutilation. Okay, the mob cuts off ears, toes, fingers, strips of flesh, and distributes portion of the body as souvenirs among the crowd. That's disgusting. And she's not exaggerating. We have the evidence. She gives a couple of examples. One in Paris, Texas, which was the killing of a man named Henry Smith for allegedly murdering a white woman. There's no evidence. Either way, quite frankly. No one knows if he did it or not. But that wasn't the point. What they did to him? They brought him into the center of the square, the scaffold. Right? This big raised platform. And they brought the family of the victim up there. The white people. The white family. And they let each one of those family members take a hot iron and burn him all the way up his body. His legs, his torso, his arms. And then finally at the end, they stuck red hot pokers in each of his eyes and then down his throat. And then they set the fucking thing on fire. On that scaffolding that they set on fire, they had written the word justice, as if that were just. Disgusting. She gives other examples. She talks about a person in Kentucky that was been burned. In Texarkana, Texas. The men and boys cut off strips of flesh and stabbed the person before they set the thing on fire. In Georgia, they just kept torturing him and torturing and torturing him before they lit the sticks on fire and burned him. These are horrific scenes. 
And again, the excuse is given. Well, we're trying to protect white women. By mutilating black bodies, that's how you protect white women? That's the reason that she's constantly being given. She ends by saying, you know what? We've lived a lot. We've, we black folk have lived among white folk for long enough that we've absorbed some of their violence. And some of our men have participated in this. Sure. I'll, you know, she says, I get that. But by the same token, here is this concern for the virtue of white women. And yet white men repeatedly rape black women. And there's no death for that. There's no capital punishment for that. It's just business as usual. And prior to the eradication of slavery, that's how the business was furthered in many cases. So what do we learn from this document? Besides the horrific practices of 19th and 20th century United States society. And besides the obvious disgust that we feel because of these killings, we also learn how frustrated Ida Wells is. And this this is a damning accusation. And frustrated is a mild word. Enraged mm. might be a better one. And we can use this source as a way of understanding the harsh social boundaries in the South. And if we ask, is the New South really new? This is evidence that it's not. Because this is one of many callbacks to the old slave system. And that sharp, horrid, disgusting practice. This is control of black bodies. Just as the lash was a control of black bodies. And so be wary of arguments that offer a complimentary appraisal of the South during the Jim Crow era. Because white supremacy was really strong and very much alive in this practice. Very clearly. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the video. If you have any questions about lynching, Ida B. Wells or chapter 18 of the American Yacht, please feel free to reach out to me in an email or in a uh, comment. Happy to uh, answer as many questions as I possibly can. If you're new to the channel and not one of my current students, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. If you are one of my current students, thanks for watching another video. I appreciate it. You can also like, comment, and subscribe, but don't feel like you have to just because you're in my class. That would be a little weird. In any case, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.